grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, a man was walking along all by himself through the, through the woods, and he was deep in thought, and his con- concentration was suddenly broken as he almost stumbled over this just giant anthill. But it looked like someone had already stumbled over it because it was all busted apart. Maybe an animal had gotten into it, or maybe someone else had walked over it. But it was all just broken up, and there were just hundreds and hundreds of ants just scurrying around, frantically trying to put their little world back in order. And he looked down, and he tried to see what they were doing, if there were anything he could help with, but of course he couldn't. They were just in a panic and scurrying all around. And if he would try to help, of course, they would just think he was an enemy and start attacking him, and they'd probably start biting him. And he was wishing that he could somehow tell these ants that he didn't want to hurt them, that he wanted to help them, that he was going to do something, and and he would really be able to, to make their lives better but how to communicate with them. I mean, he doesn't speak ant, of course, and even if they spoke English, just his gigantic size in comparison, he would just be this frightening, horrible monster to them. And even even his gentlest, softest voice, it would just be all too loud and too distorted for them to even understand anything that he was saying. So as he thought about this for quite a while, he finally came up with this idea that Well, you know, the really only way that I could help these ants out, the only way I could ever communicate them with them and let them know that I wanted to do something nice for them would be if I could somehow become an ant. But, of course, he couldn't. And yet our God could. And he did just that. In St. John's account of the very first Christmas, and this is just beautifully elegant for the, the simplicity of the language here, The apostle under divine inspiration writes, the word became flesh. That was after just this beautifully constructed argument that says that the word is true and very God. That this word that he's using is God himself, the one who made everything, the one who is the only source of life and light. And that God uses this as a way to express himself. This is divine self-expression. It's a way that, that God could communicate who he is to those who otherwise could not know that at all. For as John writes a little later, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God. That they know this one who's the word, God himself, and, and, and we know him, right? He's, he, he's Jesus. And, and anyone looking at Jesus lying there in the manger can can clearly see that this Jesus is is truly human. I mean, he only weighs seven or eight pounds, that little baby boy. He's got to be less than 20 inches tall. And shouldn't that hay be a little too scratchy, a little too dusty to put that little baby in? And what is that smell? It smells like animals in here, not in here, but where Jesus was. It smells like animals in here. But it was going to get a lot worse a lot humbler, a lot more uncomfortable, a lot lower as he would suffer and bleed and die. I mean, who could ever miss that this little one born as this baby in that manger, that that he's truly human? You know, what God wants us to know is that for not even one millisecond of the time he spent those 33 or 30-some years walking this earth in our place, that not for one millisecond was he anything less than true and very God. We have seen his glory. The glory he has is the one and only, the only begotten of the Father. The miracle that Holy Scriptures call Emmanuel. Literally, God with us, and this was literally God with us in the manger. That one born in a manger was God with us, but he didn't start existing then. He didn't even start existing nine months earlier than that. He has always existed from all of eternity. This one that needed his mommy to hold him and feed him and carry him and change him, he made everything that exists. He's Lord of lords and King of kings. The truly amazing thing here is that this one who had every holy reason not to care about us sinful humans 
cared about us so much that he decided to come down here to our little messed up anthill and straighten things out. But to throw himself into our situation, think how much the God of all had to shrink himself down. The God who fills the entire universe. Shrunk himself down to the point of becoming one of us. Made himself so small. I saw a movie when I was a little kid, so this is a long time ago, 50-some years ago, but it was one of those Cold War movies, so it's got to be Soviet military and scientists against American military and scientists, right? And both of them, both sides had figured how to shrink things down to the size of a microbe. Well, the Russians or the Soviets had gotten a hold of our good guy scientists and conked him on the head or something, and he was about to die. And so the scientists from the American side shrunk down this submarine full of, of military medical people the size of a microbe, and they could inject it into that good guy scientist's bloodstream. And it could navigate to where they could take care of that blood clot that they couldn't have fixed from the outside in any way. Jesus, God the Son, shrunk himself down small enough to become into our humanity. You know how little that is? For the first 12 hours of the time he spent here in this one who was to be called Jesus after he was born, he was only one cell big. Because he's such a loving God. Because he cares so much about us, he couldn't just let us destroy ourselves and, and, and sink to hell in our sin. He was too caring to just say, hey, they brought it on themselves. Those people down there, they're so selfish. They're so, so greedy, so stingy, so unloving, so prideful that they deserve what they get. They brought this on themselves. Let them try to straighten this out. And he didn't. And he couldn't. And he couldn't just give us a life preserver or throw us a line because we had no ability to be able to grab onto that. Or to even realize that he is the one who's on our side, that, that he's not an enemy, that he loves us and wants to save us and wants to help us and wants us with him forever. And beside all that, God's holy word tells us that a person apart from God has no ability. We are dead in our sins, the Bible says. And so we have no ability to do this. The only thing that would work, the only possible situation, was for this one to become one of us. For God to come down to our messed up anthill, to, to, to put himself into our miserable anthood, or antness, whatever is the better term for that to become one of us so he could substitute for us in keeping all those requirements that God had made of us but we don't keep and then to go to the cross and suffer and die for us as that one payment that would be enough to remove the guilt of everyone's sins ever Jesus the unique God man Jesus the only way to be able to be underneath God's law and still do it all perfectly The only way to be able to to push us aside and replace us in suffering the shame and death that our sins required and still have that be valuable and precious enough to pay for absolutely everyone's sins ever. The only way to suffer and die as the substitute for all of our sins. For God to become one of us, to communicate to us, to help us, to save us, to give us forever with him. As he lets us know in John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory he has as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Merry Christmas. Amen. We now have the opportunity to confess that Christian faith we share. We'll do that this evening using the words of the second article and its meaning. Would you please stand as you are able? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Please be seated.